Good morning. morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We are so glad that you are gathering with us for worship this morning. Welcome to those of you here in the sanctuary with us. Also, uh, welcome to those of you joining us online. Um, We're really glad that you're here. If you're a guest, we're especially glad that you're here and would love to get to know you better. We need your help to do that. If you are in the sanctuary, would you notice there are connect cards in the pew in front of you? Our hope is that you might complete that and make it your offering by putting it in the plate uh, after the service. And if you're with us online, we'd love if you would send us an email so that we could get to know you better that way as well. There's lots happening in the life of the church. I know I say that often. It's always true. It's especially true this week. Um, Case in point, I have five announcements for you. We almost always limit ourselves to two. There are five. All of these are in the newsletter that you receive every Friday by email. So I'll not give you details, but I'm calling these things out to jog your memory. And then you can go look at the email uh, yourself for details. So in order of how they are happening, here they are. Number one, four o'clock this afternoon, there is a youth recital. A dozen or more children from this church will be in this place playing piano, playing violin, playing flute, It would be great to have their church family come and support them in that. You are invited. Two, uh, church merch. If you would like a First Pres or First Presbyterian shirt or hat or sticker for your car, this is the last day you can order at the storefront. You can find the digital way to do that in the newsletter, or you can go to Stacy at the table out here after the service, and she can help you order. Three, this Thursday is the last afternoon recital. So consider coming and joining us for that recital. Four, some of our own First Pres students at Perrysburg High School are putting on what they're calling the Baby U Bash this Saturday in support of Baby University, one of our mission partners. The Ludwig girls and Owen Leib, we're very proud of them. Notice in the newsletter and come if you are able to support that effort. And then five, next Sunday, We celebrate Confirmation Sunday. Very much looking forward to that. Many of you have already sent notes to our confirmands, notes of encouragement um, and and faith. If you have intentions to do that but have not yet, you have six days. So, So let's look forward to celebrating Confirmation next week. Reminder, all of that's in the newsletter. You can go read it for yourself. Could I invite you to stand? Allow me to pray, and we will come more fully into worship together. Oh, Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the life that you have given us together, a life with you at its head. Would you enable us in these moments, Lord, to uh, focus on you, uh, encounter us anew by your spirit, enable us to, to know you through your word, to be filled and then sent as servants to your mission. We give thanks for the privilege of worship this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Crawford Strunk will lead us in our call to worship, which is before you. Please join me in the call to worship uh, this morning. It can be found before you in your order of worship or in the wall in front of you, uh, taken from Psalm 118. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen.
Seeing that we have a great high priest who has entered the inmost heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with fullest confidence that we may receive mercy for our failures and grace to help in the hour of need. In the strength of this assurance, let us confess our sins to God using the prayer of confession that is before you. We will read responsibly and I will begin. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. We pray these things through Christ our Lord. And now a moment of silence for uh, individual reflection. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another and share in the, the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us share one another a sign of Christ's peace. You may be seated. One of the joys we have this morning is receiving new members into the life of the church. We received uh, quite a number of new members this morning in the 9 a.m. service. There was a, a picture, and this morning uh, we are receiving Carol Nielsen into the membership of the church as well. So Carol is the one with the flower. <laughs> Nancy is her daughter, one of the uh, elders of the church, and, and Janet Russ Jones is her deacon, and so they are standing uh, here uh, with Carol, and we are very, very grateful. Um, and I just stole Crawford's thunder again. It's, it's okay. I, I, I still do have that to do my job, all the time. So you know, um, on behalf of session, I present Carol Nielsen uh, for membership into the church. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Carol, you come to us as a member of the one holy Catholic Church into which you were baptized, and by which you have been nurtured. We are one with each other, sisters and brothers in the family of God. We rejoice in the gifts you bring to us as you join with us in worship and service of this congregation. It is fitting that together we reaffirm the covenant into which we were baptized, claiming again the promises of God which are ours in baptism. We remember what we're told in God's word, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that you... Not just you, Carol, but you, all of us, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, 
in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called you out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Our baptism is the sign and seal of our cleansing from sin and of our being grafted into Christ. That's why I pour water into the baptismal uh, bowl every time we gather in worship. Through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the power of sin was broken, and God's kingdom entered our world. Through our baptism, we were made citizens of God's kingdom and freed from the bondage of sin. Let us celebrate that freedom and redemption through the, re the renewal of the promises made at our baptism. And so, Carol, I will ask you, uh, therefore, once again to reject sin and to profess your faith in Christ Jesus and to confess the faith of the church into which we were baptized. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, answer, I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, answer, I do. I do. And will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, answer, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Amen. This is a time for the whole church to affirm our faith once again. Uh, in a little bit, as we consider the scripture together, we will be talking about the life Jesus calls us to live together. And so I thought it right to use a portion of the Westminster Confession that speaks of the way of life that we are called to as Christ's disciples together. And so I would turn your eyes to the screens in front of you. Uh, this is chapter 10 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, one of the confessions uh, that guides our church. Let us affirm our faith together by reciting these words. God, in infinite and perfect love, having provided in the covenant of grace through the mediation and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, a way of life and salvation, sufficient for and adapted to the whole lost race of man, doth freely offer this salvation to all men in the gospel. In the gospel, God declares his love for the world and his desire that all men should be saved, reveals fully and clearly the only way of salvation, promises eternal life to all who truly repent and believe in Christ, invites and commands all to embrace the offered mercy and by his spirit, accompanying the word, pleads with men to accept this gracious invitation. This is the faith we share and affirm together. And so Carol, one more question as you come into this congregation. You have publicly professed your faith. Will you now be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Amen. Let's pray together. Oh Lord God, we give thanks that you have drawn Carol back into the life of this congregation. We give thanks for the others as well who joined earlier this morning. We give thanks that you call us together to be church family in this place, to encourage and support one another to point one another towards you, to band together for your kingdom purposes in our community and our world. Defend, O oh Lord, your servant Carol with your heavenly grace, that she may continue to be yours forever and daily increase in your spirit. Help her to become rooted in the life of this congregation. Uh, help her to know more and more of her brothers and sisters in Christ in this place until we all come into your everlasting kingdom, we pray. Amen. Carol, we welcome you to this congregation and its worship and ministry. Yay! You may be seated.
change hats again. It's always a wonder for me because I always think Kristen and Pastor Clint have this way of asking me to be the liturgist on the days when we have to uh, read um, very interesting topics. And today is the passage about all the Greek philosophers. And as a classics major, I find it fascinating that I get to, to be the liturgist again today. So, but before we read and turn to God's word, uh, let's uh, offer this prayer of illumination. Please pray with me. Lord God, give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Christ, so that the eyes of our hearts might be enlightened. Help us to know the hope to which you have called us, the riches of the glorious inheritance in the saints, and the immeasurable greatness of your power at work in us. We pray these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today's scripture lesson is taken from Acts uh, chapter 17, uh, verses 16 through 31. It can be found on page 1111 in your pew Bibles. Hear the word of the Lord. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this blabber trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the, bound, and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he was not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Leave your scripture open, I would encourage you to, or at least put a bookmark in it. We will return and look at it closely in just a moment. But before we do, I wonder, do you know Socrates? Not, not personally. I'm not asking if you know him personally. <laughs> Raise your hand if you know who Socrates is. We had a bunch of, yeah, I figured there'd be a better, uh, better group of knowledge here. We had a bunch of high school students uh, this morning, and they went, Socrates, who is that? Socrates. Socrates, as you know, uh, is one of the greatest philosophers of the ancient world. He was a, a Greek philosopher. Um, uh, 
known today uh, by the method of teaching we often call the Socratic method, right? If you have a teacher who uh, doesn't tell you very much, but simply asks question after question after question, what is this? Why do you think that? How did you come to that conclusion? That's the Socratic method, known, uh, known to be rooted in the teaching and the life of Socrates. Socrates is known for a couple of statements that he made. One of them is this, the unexamined life is not worth living. The unexamined life is not worth living. Root that in your mind, for that's a a mantra I want us to carry into the Scripture together. The unexamined life is, is not worth living. This was a statement that Socrates made during a trial that led to his eventual conviction and execution. You're looking at that statement and going, whoa, someone was executed for something in relationship to that? That seems kind of simple. What was was the charge against Socrates? Well, here it was. According to Plato, the Greek historian, uh, he was accused of corrupting the youth of the city of Athens with his teaching. He was accused of failing to acknowledge the gods that the city acknowledges. And he was accused of introducing new deities. I bring this up because I find it interesting that Socrates, having lived uh, in Athens about 500 years prior to the Apostle Paul, died for the very same things we see the Apostle Paul doing in that, that very same city. And I think the words of Socrates, and more importantly, The words of the Scripture ought to call each of us uh, to think about this phrase, uh, that the unexamined life is not worth living. When was the last time you examined your life? When was the last time you, you give serious thought to questions like, am I living well And how would I define well? What is the philosophy that guides my life? What am I living for? And how am I seeking to be fulfilled? The passage we've just heard read tees up an examination of our life using questions like that. And so I want to pray and then kind of enter into the passage together, Uh, not only to understand what what was written for people long ago, but but that God's Word might be used by God's Spirit uh, to examine us, that we might uh, more fully take hold of a way of life given to us in Jesus Christ. So let's let's pray together, and then we'll do that. Uh, Lord, we do come to your Word, and we ask that you would speak. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would impress upon us your holy word in such a way that we don't merely hear and understand, but that we receive and we obey and that we are transformed more and more into the people you have created, redeemed, and called us to be. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Well, put the scene painted in in this scripture in your your mind's eye, if you will. The Apostle Paul is is there in the city of Athens. If you read in the preceding verses, you'll be aware that that he's there and he's waiting. He's waiting on his friends, Timothy and Silas, to to meet him there. And so he's, he's kind of killing time, if you will. Kind of like when you're at an airport or, or some other midway point in your travel. So too, Paul is here in Athens, and he is looking around at the city um, that confronts him. Now, Athens in that day 
was an important city, but nothing like it was in the days of Socrates. 500 years prior, it was one of the most important cities in the world. Now it was a city in decline. Still a center of culture and education, but not nearly as influential as it had been before. Certainly was a city still dominated by by religion and philosophy. You heard in the text that one of the favorite things for the people to do was to come to the market square and just ponder and debate new ideas. Around the city, you would see all sorts of structures and temples and statues that would represent different religious ideas. But religion in Athens wasn't what it used to be. In fact, it had descended into kind of just a a deification of, of human attributes and of the powers of nature. It exalted kind of art and amusement And it was devoid of any real moral power. So if you know Greek mythology, think about it this way. You know Zeus and and Poseidon and Aphrodite and all of those people. That instead of becoming devoted, the people kind of looked at these characters more out of amusement or entertainment than they did as as a pattern for their life. And they are entertaining, right? I mean, here's a depiction of what one of the buildings might have looked like back then. We see Zeus there in the center and the whole pantheon of gods. And it's, it's so entertaining that, that this thinking still informs our culture today. One of my kids' favorite books that became a movie was the Percy Jackson series that, that puts this young child in the midst of a world that is uh, led and influenced by this Greek pantheon of gods. So here you have this city, entertained, amused, they loved to debate, but there was no kind of moral anchor. There was no philosophy that that guided all people and helped them understand what is true and right and good. And so what's Paul's response, his heart level response? Do you see it in verse 16? While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, He was greatly distressed to see all these idols. That word distressed is is an interesting one in Greek. It's a complex word. It, It means to provoke or to frustrate. It could mean sadness or anxiety, but it also could mean anger. Paul's looking around. You put this in your mind's eye. Paul's looking around, and he's seeing all of these images, and he's listening to the conversations, and he's, he's noticing how captivated the people are with this and with that, and he becomes deeply distressed. How does your heart react when you look at the world around us? But I want to suggest to you the world that we inhabit is not all that different from the world of ancient Athens. Ancient uh, Athens was a city in decline. Some would say that our nation is not what it once was. It also is in decline. Athens was a city given uh, to art and amusement, entertainment and sport. Is there any denying that our culture as well is given to entertainment and art to athletics and sport? I mean, how much money are these athletes making? And how big are the structures uh, that, that house these things? How big are they? If we were to look at our world, would we, our response not be uh, too dissimilar from what Paul saw? What, what's the reaction of our heart? As we look at our world and as we look at ourselves... Do we recognize the philosophies that guide our world and that call to our own heart? This this passage gives us an opportunity to examine ourselves, to recognize together. There are two philosophies lifted up in this passage that 
can help us think about our own life. They're listed there in verse 18. When Paul goes to the center square, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers meet him there. I think this is important detail. I do not claim to be an expert, and I will try to not bore you, but I just want to make sure we all understand who these groups of people are, for I think they represent uh, kind of the poles of a continuum we might find ourselves on. So first, the Epicureans. Epicureans were people who did not believe in God. They were atheists. They lived for the moment. They thought this world and what we see is all that there is, and therefore, uh, do whatever makes you happy was their mantra. Pleasure, if you will, was their God. There were Epicureans in Athens coming to listen to and question the Apostle Paul. The Stoics were almost the complete opposite. The Stoics were not atheists. Um, they believed in a deity or a god, but, but not in the way that we do. They were kind of pantheists. They believed God was in everything, and everything was in God. And so unlike the Epicureans, who's, you know, based on happiness, their emotional state went up and down and up and down, the Stoics' philosophy was, we're going to seek to control everything in life that we can control. We're going to control our finances and save for a rainy day. We're going to control our emotions. We're going to control our relationships. We just want to be on this even keel. Stoic, right? We know that word. I don't know about you. Epicureanism is a, easy for me to grasp. Stoicism is a little harder. It was helpful when I came uh, 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 upon the kind of example that... Um, <laughs> modern-day example that, that a pretty good depiction of the Stoics, if you're a Star Wars fan, are the Jedi. Right? You know Star Wars? You know Yoda, Luke, all of that? You remember some of the, some of the philosophy in that movie? Yoda says to Luke, oh, be careful. You're afraid. I sense much fear in you. Fear leads to the dark side, right? Likewise, I was just watching with some of my kids and and, and, and when Anakin has a, a romantic interest, Yoda's there again saying, desire, be careful about desire. The Stoic just wants to control everything in their life. One of the commentaries I read, uh, written by Warren Wiersbe, uh, succinctly put it this way, the Epicureans said, enjoy life. And the Stoics said, Endure life, right? If we think about those two things as a kind of poles on a continuum, and then we think about ourself, we use that kind of as a way to examine ourselves and say, which kind of pole pulls me more than the other? I think it's an important question. For I think everybody is pulled one way or the other. Certainly, we can see all sorts of Epicureans in our culture today, correct? There are lots of people who simply live for pleasure. If it feels good, do it. We're living for the weekend. Or another clue might be the, the level of consumer debt, right? I just want to take that trip. I just want that thing. I just want that experience. I don't care if I don't have the money. I'm going to put it on the card. Well, that's a kind of an Epicurean cue. Then there's those on the other side. Those who tend towards stoicism. I'm going to save. I'm going to invest. I'm going to endure. I'm going to be careful. I'm going to be self-sufficient. I'm going to be so responsible that I won't ever have to depend on anybody else, not even God. You see the two? You see the two poles? Like those in Athens, our culture crafts images or idols that represent these poles. 
So if you haven't figured out yet, what, what am I talking about and where am I on the spectrum? Maybe, maybe this will help. Here's one image, right? Here's an Epicurean image, right? I mean, how much of our, of our architecture, of our money, of our time is invested in sport simply for pleasure at Cleveland Stadium? Yeah, Browns fans don't get a whole lot of pleasure a whole lot of times, but, but you get my point, right? And though it may not be a statue in a, in a city square, maybe here's a representation of stoicism, uh, if you find yourself every month checking your 401k, or even every day or multiple times a day, as I know some people do, checking that ticker below the screen, and this last month has left you really on a roller coaster ride, ooh, right? There's some clues. Which philosophy pulls at you? I'd suggest one or the other does. And if you think that it doesn't, you're fooling yourself. Now let's offer just one word of clarification. Am I saying that pleasure is bad? No. God created pleasure. God made us to experience pleasure. Pleasure is good in its right place. Am I saying that we should not be responsible, that we should not save, we shouldn't invest? No, there's all sorts of biblical passages and wisdom that say, save, 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 be careful, be responsible. What I am saying is, if either one of those is the foundation of your life, is the answer to the question, I will be fulfilled when I take that trip or I save this amount of money, that this is the purpose of my life, oh, friends, you're on a path that leads to destruction. And the Apostle Paul sat there in Athens, and he looked all around, and his heart was dist distressed because he saw all sorts of people that God loved heading down a path that would destroy. And so he sought to hold out a different philosophy, the philosophy that would enable us not to just enjoy life or endure life, but to enter into life given to us in Jesus Christ, the one who made it all. And so I want to look at that a little bit together. I hope you, your Bible is open because I'll point to some verses here. Look at what Paul does. He first builds a bridge with his listeners. He goes, I see you're very religious. I appreciate that you have a God for everything you could think of and just to hedge your bets. In case there's a God you hadn't thought of, you even have an inscription for an unknown God, right? He says, let me tell you about that unknown God. And in verse 24, he begins to lay out the gospel. He says, the God, the God who made the whole world and everything in it, he's Lord of heaven and earth. And who's he speaking to with that one single statement? Is it not the Epicureans, the ones who live for pleasure? There is a God. He made everything that there is. He's Lord of heaven and earth. So think twice when you automatically think that everything you have, everything you've been given, should be spent on your own pleasure. Maybe it was given to you for a, a different purpose. He continues on. Verse 25, um, and he is not, this God is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Who's he speaking to? Would it not be the Stoics? Oh, there's a God out there, but that God requires me to control my life. And so I'm going to take over. And I'm going to manage things. I'm going to manage my relationships. I'm going to manage my emotions. I'm going to manage my finances so that I never need help from anyone else. Not even God. He continues on, verse 26. From one man he made all the nations that they would inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him. And perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. He takes on Greek mythology. 
this God that you do not know. He's not some God far off, Zeus sitting up in his temple. No, he is near, and he desires a relationship with you. He goes on, verse 30. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the whole world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. He begins by building a bridge, but make no mistake, Paul brings the truth. And he says, in the past, God overlooked all the ignorance of all these philosophies and all this mythology, but not anymore. For God has sent his son into the world, and life is found in his son. He says to them, and we should take in ourselves as well, the truth that one day, one day, a day we don't know when it is, one day, he will come and judge the whole world with justice. How do we know? Well, here's an evangelism cue. He be roots it all in the resurrection. You know that thing we celebrated a couple of weeks ago? <laughs> Friends, our, our faith rises and falls in the resurrection, does it not? Yeah, we have all sorts of questions. Also, is it seven days, literal days that God created the world or seven periods of time? What about the dinosaurs? How about all the bad things that happen to good people? Lots of good philosophical questions. But friends, the resurrection is the basis for our understanding. If Jesus rose from the dead, does that not demand the allegiance of all who would seek to follow him? Say yes. Yes, yes, right, right. And if he did not, yeah, we're wasting our time. Which is whatever, you know. We'll go along with the Epicureans and the Stoics and the Christians and they'll all be. I don't think that's the case. Because Jesus rose from the dead. Look at your life. What philosophy are you guided by? In Paul's own words, in verse 29, again, yeah, he does take one of the Greek uh, poets and he turns their words and uses it against his audience. He says, as some of your own poets have said, we are as offspring. And if that's true, he said that ought to determine the way we use our gold or silver or stone. The Greeks had used them to make these images, right? Representing patterns and ways of life that were absolutely false. We can, metaphorically speaking, use our gold to examine ourselves and say, yeah, what does guide us? What is our philosophy of life? Go look at your bank account over the last year. What will it say? Will it say the pattern of your life is to seek pleasure above all else? You went out to eat this many times. You took these trips. You bought these things. Will it say that the pattern of your life is to try to control and guard against every danger there ever was? I'm just storing it away and storing it away and storing it away. Or will it reflect the truth of verse 28? In him we live and move and have our being. It's tough. We live in a world that's not all that much different from Athens. It pulls us one way or the other. And Jesus says, I want to guide you in the only way that leads to true life. That's why nurturing the spiritual discipline of giving is so important. It'll be an important part of Covenant Renewal Sunday coming up here in a little bit. 
And it's why I'm so grateful that Sue Stevenson agreed to share her story with us in anticipation of that day. Sue's sitting right up here. I don't know if she knew this was coming up this morning or not. You did. Okay, good. A couple of weeks ago, uh, almost by chance, if there was such a thing in God's economy, Sue was sharing her story with me. And it was exactly the story that, that I hope we would all be able to tell of our own lives. It's a story of how God taught her to trust him more and more and more. It's a story I want us to write together uh, in a few weeks on Covenant Renewal Sunday. But before we do that, I want you to hear Sue's story. So watch, watch this video. Hi, my name is Susan Stevenson, and I've attended First Presbyterian Church of Maumee for the last 12 years. My faith has grown in many ways. First off, I'm a musician, and so the musical things that happen here at church are, are really a part of me, and it's a part of the way that I serve God, is playing my violin and handbells and singing in, in the choir. I also just want to serve God. and and to do, use the gifts that he's given me so that I can help others, help others to worship and enjoy music. So I spent a lot of time volunteering for all sorts of things, but it was just really hard to part with the money because I was so afraid that I wouldn't be able to pay my bills. Then when I came here to First Prez, um, a gentleman named Gary Brown did a class uh, called Managing Our Finances God's Way. I believe it's part of Crown Ministries. And that was just a real eye-opener for me. And I knew a lot of the principles of saving money, but the idea that Gary put out was, when you tithe, you're going to get back more than you ever imagined. And I thought, okay, God, I'm gonna put you to a little test. I went home, figured out my finances, what I actually made, and then figured out the 10% of that. And lo and behold, after I started tithing, I just didn't worry about where the money was gonna come from to pay for this or pay for that. What I needed, it just, I don't wanna say it magically appeared, but I'd get a, get a playing job that paid me a certain amount of money. Just so happened I needed that certain amount of money. But when I made a financial, a real financial commitment to the church to tithe and give, uh, give every week, any of the issues that I felt, the, the fear of not having enough money or not being able to do, do things, it's like God said, I've got this, I'm going to take care of you. I know that it can feel super scary to step out and take the money out of that checkbook and give it to the church. You have to do it with the realization that God's going to take it, he's going to work not only in your life, which is to be sure, but he's also going to work in other people's lives and people you may never meet, people, people you might meet. Just take that step out. Maybe it's a baby step to just start to give something weekly. Make it, make it a part of your routine, make it a part of your life. That's, that's how you, you, you really get started with it. And take the next step and then the next step and watch God work. I'm Susan Stevenson and I love FIRST. Thank you, Susan. Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Examine your life. Does your life, does your bank account, does your calendar represent the only philosophy that is true, that in him we live and move and have our being. As we think about that, one last clue. When you receive an ex, uh, unexpected amount of money, like, like Sue just said, when uh, a, a teaching opportunity or a playing opportunity, or, or I told my kids, when you, when you get some money from grandma in a birthday card, or, or maybe it's something as big as an inheritance, when something comes to you unexpected, ask yourself, what's my first response? Is it, oh, I can't wait to take this trip or buy this thing? Ooh, be careful. Might be pleasure. Is it, oh, I better put this away because you never know what's coming. Be careful. Might be control. 
is it? God, what would you have me do? For the whole world and everything in the world is made by you. You're Lord of heaven and earth. And so teach me and guide me. That's what we desire as we follow Jesus together. Let's pray. Lord God, we do, uh, we do notice these philosophies that pull on our soul. Philosophies that lead to, to seeking uh, our own pleasure as an end in itself or the other way, Lord. Philosophies that, that pretend that we can control life if we just accumulate enough or save enough or, or Lord, just protect ourselves. Would you defend us from both? And would you teach us, teach us to trust you more and more and more. For in you, we have life and breath and everything else. It is in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, that is the desire of our heart, that you would nurture us in love for you as we more fully understand just how deeply you have loved us at the cross. We do pray, Lord, in the midst of this very dark world where we're seeing war across the seas and shootings now in the, in the city of Buffalo and even, Lord, in our own city over these past weeks. We pray in the midst of that darkness that you would help us to exhibit your kingdom light. We pray for those affected uh, tragically in all of those ways. Would you protect, heal, nurture, comfort, but not just in an earthly, physical way, Lord. Would you use these terrible tragedies to draw people uh, to yourself? As we pray for that, we pray that you would use us, Lord, in your ways and in for your purposes. We give thanks for those who have joined our midst this morning, who has strengthened our mission uh, by their talent and their resources and their abilities. Lord God, would you use us to serve this community and world. So it is we pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So it is, this time of offering is really important. Not just to, to meeting the budget of the church, though we appreciate that. It's, it's so that the offering, what we give, would guide our own heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so I encourage you in this time to give, to tithe joyfully and generously, that you might indeed fall more and more in love with Jesus as you do. Uh, you can give in the plates in the back. You can give online, whatever is best for you. As you do, we do continue to anticipate Covenant Renewal Sunday, June 5th. We've been talking about it for some weeks now. I really, really hope that you will make every effort to be with us. Uh, we will be celebrate, remembering and celebrating God's faithfulness to us over these past two plus years in the pandemic. I've forgotten some of the things that we experienced together. Uh, but we're, we're going to remember that. We're going to thank God, and then we're going to renew our commitment uh, to, to one another and to God around worship and service and giving. There will be a kind of a special card to help us do all of that that we hand out on June 5th, but, but we know that some people, especially when it comes to giving, uh, rightfully want to take time, pray, think, talk to your spouse if you have one. And so we've made a copy of the giving part of that card. Um, and there are, that, that giving card is on the information table. If you'd like to take it so you can see it, see some of the language that we're using, we'd encourage you to do that. With that, let's stand together and sing our closing hymn, How Great Thou Art. Note, we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4 as we do.
Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. As you go, go remembering these words. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. May you go in the confidence of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.